Sejin still furious with a loud voice while pointing his finger commanded everyone to sit down. The mommy bear, ox number three, the baby bear, along with all the rabbits and Theo, as well as the tower manager with a sad face, realizing they were wrong, sat silently without saying a single word. After that, the situation came a little under control. Sejin, still angry, said to both the mommy bear and ox number three that if both of them went on a rampage like that, not just the field and crops but even Sejin and his other animal friends would get harmed too. So they must not fight. After that, Sejin turned back toward the rabbits and with a warm smile said, now they have to prepare a meal, as only by eating delicious food will everyone's mood get happy and good. It will also help in making friends between the mommy bear and ox number three. All the rabbits replied to Sejin with a cute, yes, sir, and Sejin, while clapping his hands with a warm smile, said, well then, let's eat shall we? With this command, the warrior rabbit started to hunt crayfish and piranhas with his newly evolved hammer. Then the sickle rabbit started to chop spring onion leaves while the white rabbit, one by one, started to roast some mouth-watering corn on the campfire. The chubby and cart rabbit, while glaring and drooling upon seeing the roasted corn, started to transport the roasted corn and the spring onion. Sejin started to cook the meal. He first roasted some spring onions in his pan with delicious spices. Then he placed freshly roasted corn on a plate made with onion leaves, and roasted piranhas wrapped in onion leaves placed on a plate also made with onion. Additionally, there was a full plate full of spring onions. Well, this was a feast. The mommy bear and ox number three, upon seeing this delicious food in front of them, couldn't help but open their mouths in amazement and excitement with sparkling eyes. And the next moment, they dug into the feast. Mommy Bear and Ox Number 3 were sitting next to each other in front of the array of delicious foods, and Sejin and all his animal friends were also sitting in front of the food. Sejin politely told Mommy Bear and Ox Number 3 to eat to their heart's content. Mommy Bear was about to eat, but ox number three had already started eating the spring onions. Sejin then picked up a plate full of roasted corn and happily handed it to the tower manager. The tower manager thanked Sejin in advance. Ox number three, extremely happy while chewing a piece of onion, slowly approached to pick a piece of roasted corn. But before he could pick one, his hand clashed with mommy bears as she was also trying to pick a piece of roasted corn. Then, once again, they started to glare at each other while growling, ready to go on a rampage. He and his animal friends were left sitting speechless. Sejin, while clearing his throat and raising his voice, said that he was going to announce something very important to make the situation calm. He first came close to Mommy Bear and then, with a polite tone, said to Ox Number 3 that this is Mommy Bear. She protects his cave and field and she lives together with her cub named Kung. As he was introducing Mommy Bear to Ox Number 3, she was just sitting there still angry and breathing heavily. Then Sejin went to Ox Number 3 and said, but before he could say anything, Ox Number 3 cut him off midway and with an arrogant tone said that he is Ox Number 3, a minotaur proud warrior. Then, still with a polite tone, Sejin explained to Mommy Bear that this minotaur is called Ox Number 3, and he is going to help him with field work. As Sejin was explaining this, Theo was just sitting on his lap, listening to all of this. Finally, Sejin with a serious tone explained to both of them that now that they know each other and know that they are not enemies, they have to become friends with each other and not fight in the future. If they ever, even for a second fight, he is not going to give them food. Well, just hearing this, both Mommy Bear and Ox Number Three's worlds turned upside down. Just thinking that they will not be able to drink and eat any food. And the next moment, the enemies started exchanging warm handshakes like they were long lost friends. Then they clung to each other's hands and started taking oaths that they would never ever fight in the future with sparkling eyes. Well, they were friends now. Meanwhile, Theo was just sleeping on Sejin's lap like a king. Then Sejin, while cuddling Theo, said to Ox Number 3 to just follow him, and he will show what Ox Number 3's work is. Then he brought Ox Number 3 to the barren field. While looking at the field, 
he explained to ox number three that his work is very simple. Ox number three just has to dig up the ground, just like he did on the day of the blue moon, but not as rough as he did on the blue moon. Ox number three just has to dig a little rough and solid ground until the soft soil comes. Hearing this, ox number three excitedly asked him if he really has to just dig the soil, and after that, he will get one tower coin with as much food as he can eat. Sejin, with a proud look on his face, replied, Of course, he is telling the truth, as he is a very good boss who doesn't exploit his workers. After that, ox number three got into position, lowering his body, and Sejin and Theo just watched curiously, thinking about how ox number three was going to dig the soil. The next moment, ox number three started to shake his body, started to glow purple, and his horn started to grow big. His eyes turned big, and Sejin and Theo were surprised. With a large growl, ox number three dashed while lowering his head with huge horns. And as he was going forward, because of his huge horns, the ground was getting plowed. While plowing this ground, ox number three was daydreaming, opening his mouth, and drooling excessively with sparkling eyes. He was just thinking about eating the delicious spring onions after work. Sejin and Theo were watching him from behind, seeing how ox number three easily plowed the ground like a bulldozer. Afterward, finally, ox number three plowed the field, and the chubby rabbit with his cart full of spring onions brought them to him. Behind him was the father rabbit, ready with his watering can, and the shovel rabbit, ready to plant the spring onions. He said, let's plant some spring onions, and everyone was happy and excited at the same time to plant them. After that, Sejin, one by one, started to plant the spring onions in the ground, and ox number three was playing with the baby bear, showing off his muscles. Baby bear was impressed seeing the muscular ox number three. Then, while planting the spring onions, he explained that it's not difficult to grow spring onions. They only have to plant spring onions once, and after that, whenever the spring onions fully grow, all they have to do is cut the spring onions in half and the spring onions will grow fully again from the half-cut spring onion. As he continued to plant the spring onions, the system notified him that he had created a 20 square meter spring onion field and acquired 200 XP. Finally, all the spring onions were planted, and he stood beside the planted spring onion field with a proud look on his face. He was chewing on a spring onion and said, spring onions grow really fast inside the tower. So from now on, I will have an infinite amount of spring onions, and I can also feed ox number three as much as he wants. Then he turned toward the husband rabbit who was watering the spring onion leaves. He said, there is only one problem. After that, the husband rabbit's watering can suddenly stopped working, and the husband rabbit started to slam his watering can. Sejin, with a worried face, continued, the only problem now is that there is a limit to the amount of water in the watering can. So it's not possible to water all the crops, and we have to go inside the cave and manually bring water from the pond or wait until the watering can recharge. As fully as Sejin was wondering what to do, suddenly, the husband rabbit's whole body started to glow blue. His baby watering cat rabbit came close to see what was happening and even Sejin got a little curious and asked why the light was coming from the husband rabbit's body. The next moment, the husband rabbit's watering can evolved and turned golden. The husband rabbit was very, very happy with sparkling eyes and gently raised his hand to catch the floating golden watering can. After that, as the husband rabbit very happily held his new golden watering can and stared at it, Sejin exclaimed in excitement, the water in it changed and evolved just like what happened to the warrior rabbit. This is the second awakening I've seen. Raising both his hands, he continued saying, the timing is perfect, and I'm happy for the husband rabbit. Then, Sejin asked the husband rabbit, now, how much water can the husband rabbit hold? The husband rabbit confidently showed with his finger, two times. Now I can hold water two times more than before, and I can regenerate the empty water can two times faster. Hearing this while clenching his fist, Sujiwan exclaimed, twice. That is great. Then, while raising his hand, 
he started to cheer for the husband rabbit and the baby watering rabbit, saying, now they can continue their watering, and the spring onion will grow nicely. Meanwhile, the Minotaur King was sitting on his throne, shining and wondering what happened to Ox number three. Why he's not returning for three days? After that, Sejin picked up all the newly born baby rabbits and put them in his bag. He then brought them outside the cave and released them, saying, today is the first day of the baby rabbits, and he brought them out to show them the outside of the cave. Sejuan introduced the baby rabbits to the baby bear, and the baby bear, with a warm smile, gently welcomed them by holding their tiny paws. Then, all the baby rabbits came close to the baby bear's mouth and started sniffing the baby bear. The next moment, the baby bear started to lick the baby rabbits, startling them. Finally, after the licking session was over, all the baby rabbits, for a moment, just stared at the baby bear, thinking about what had just happened. Then, in an instant, all together, they jumped and climbed on top of the baby bear's chest. The baby bear, with his open hand, welcomed the baby rabbits. Then, the baby bear lay on the ground, and all the baby rabbits started to play on his chest, and some took a little nap. Sejin and Theo were watching this heartwarming moment from behind. Sejin was really happy, but Theo was not. He was angry, standing with his arms crossed. Sejin said to Theo, Baby Bear and the Baby Rabbit seem to be getting along, and the Baby Rabbits seem really happy. After that, Theo, with confidence, laughed a little and said, I'm Uncle Theo, and the Baby Rabbits like me more than the Baby Bear. Then, to prove he was right, Theo turned and said to all the baby rabbits, let's go with him as Uncle Theo has come, and now he will take them on an exciting adventure outside the cave. The baby bears and all the rabbits listened to Theo without saying anything for a moment. After a while, Theo noticed that all the baby rabbits were just ignoring him and started to play with the baby bear. The baby bear, once again, started to like the baby rabbits, and yes, they were really having fun. But Theo, on the other hand, well, his heart broke into millions of pieces. Theo fell to the ground on his knees and started to cry while shivering, asking the baby rabbits, did they forget their uncle Theo? How can they forget their lovable uncle Theo who loved them so much? How can they betray him? He started to smash the ground, saying, after all the things he went through to raise them, this is the result he got. As Theo continued to cry, Sejin couldn't do anything but just stand there silently, not knowing what to do. Then, Sejin gently held Theo, saying not to be too sad. Sejin placed Theo on his lap, telling him to take a seat. The baby rabbits hadn't forgotten Theo, they were just playing with the baby bear. After that, they would definitely come to Theo. And now, Sejin would give Theo some churu, but Theo was just sitting there, pouting and angry. Then, while feeding Theo some churu, Sejin asked curiously, it's almost time for Theo to go to the lower floor to sell and trade. So why is Theo not going? Theo, with a worried and sweet face, explained that he didn't want to go or to be clear, he didn't think he could go, even if he wanted to. Sejin got a little confused and asked, what does that mean? Theo, getting more worried and panicked, explained everything that happened to him. He told how the Silver Wolf tribe attacked him. As Theo was explaining, the baby bear and the baby rabbit continued to play. Then, upon hearing Theo's whole story, Sejin couldn't believe what he was hearing. That a bunch of wolves attacked because of this straw hat. Sejin wondered, was this really special hat? Theo, still a little scared, explained that this is why he can't go to the lower floor, or they will once again attack him, and he doesn't know if he will be able to come back alive. He is really scared. Sejin, on the other hand, placed his hand on the straw hat. He took his straw hat off his head and, while staring at it, wondered. He knows this is an artifact, but it is an unnecessary item unless you are a farmer. Then, Sejuan realized there might be other farmers in this tower. Sejin, with a confident smile, once again put the straw hat on his head. Yes, he got a really good idea. 
Then, with a confident smile and a thumbs up, he said to Theo not to worry, as he had a great idea to teach a lesson to those wolves. Sejin, with a confident smile, once again put the straw hat on his head. He had a really good idea brewing in his mind. With a thumbs up, he reassured Theo that he had a brilliant plan to teach a valuable lesson to those cunning silver wolves. Theo was taken aback, his curiosity peaked, as he asked Sejin how it was even possible to stand against such formidable opponents. Sejin explained that just as the silver wolves were hired by someone, Theo could also hire someone to guard and protect him. Theo's surprise quickly transformed into excitement as he wholeheartedly agreed that it was indeed a remarkable idea. Sejin went on to elucidate that being a freelance mercenary was an exclusive occupation reserved for those who were born within the tower, just like Theo. The tower dwellers had the privilege to sign contracts with tower monsters and become mercenaries. It was a way for anyone from the tower to earn a living. By signing a contract with a client, the monster would gain the ability to traverse the tower's passages, much like wandering merchants who paid a fee. Although registering as a mercenary and obtaining a badge from the mercenary office were the typical procedures, there was a unique exception. Sejin explained that any monster could become a temporary mercenary without any registration or formalities if they signed a contract with a wandering merchant. Inspired by this, Sejin's ingenious idea was to persuade Ox Number 3 to become Theo's loyal guard. Sejin wished he could descend the tower by signing a contract with Theo as a mercenary, but alas, only those born within the tower had that privilege. Nonetheless, Theo praised Sejin's cleverness and expressed his astonishment at Sejin's remarkable memory, recalling a conversation they had shared months ago. Eager to know how they would convince the immensely powerful Ox Number 3 to become his bodyguard, Theo turned to Sejin with anticipation. Sejin confidently replied that he had an excellent plan. He would offer Ox Number 3 three times the daily rate, which equated to three tower coins, to become Theo's guardian by signing a mercenary contract. Additionally, he would sweeten the deal by offering more onion leaves, knowing Ox Number 3's fondness for them. Sejin was certain that the mere mention of onion leaves would be enough to win over Ox Number 3 as Theo's protector. Filled with excitement, Theo couldn't contain his joy and playfully took Sejin's straw hat from his head, gently patting Sejin's head and admiring him as a true genius. Sejin humbly placed his hat back on and confidently stated that it was just a small feat and that, in time, Theo would also become a genius like him if he followed Sejin's guidance. As a gesture of friendship, Sejin pulled out a packet of churu and offered it to Theo, who wagged his tail happily and eagerly accepted the treat. Little did Theo know that he had unwittingly walked into Sejin's carefully laid trap, as Sejin manipulated him through the irresistible temptation of Churu. Meanwhile, far from Sejin's cave, on the desolate barren land, Ox Number 3 was gripped with nervousness and fear, desperately trying to hide from an unknown pursuer. Suddenly, Lady Ox, a formidable warrior from Ox Number 3's clan, forcefully stamped her foot on the ground, startling Ox Number 3. Lady Ox, sensing that something was amiss, demanded an explanation from Ox Number 3 regarding his mysterious behavior and the three days she had spent searching for him. Ox Number 3, trembling and overwhelmed by fear, feigned innocence and claimed that he was merely fooling around and nothing more. However, Lady Ox's intuition told her that there was more to the story, and she cautiously approached Ox Number 3. With suspicion in her eyes, she confronted him, questioning why his face was radiating with a distinct shine and if he had been secretly indulging in something delicious. Ox Number 3 stood there, unable to utter a word. Unable to contain her curiosity and growing excitement, Lady Ox forcefully grabbed Ox Number 3's shoulder and shook him demanding to know the truth about the hidden food he had been clandestinely consuming. Overwhelmed by her relentless interrogation, Ox Number 3 finally succumbed and spilled the beans, revealing how he had encountered Sejin, obtained the Divine Spring Onion, and had been working diligently to repay his debt by receiving three meals a day. Lady Ox's face lit up with joy, and she instructed Ox Number 3 to lead her to Sejin. Ox Number 3, with a mixture of fear and excitement, 
pleaded with Lady Ox to keep their journey a secret from the other Minotaurs and the Minotaur King. Lady Ox, respecting his request, agreed, and the duo embarked on their adventure to Sejin's cave. When Sejin and Theo emerged from the cave, they were dumbfounded and filled with anxiety. Standing before them was Ox number three, appearing anxious and fearful, with Lady Ox standing firmly behind him. Upon seeing this, Sejin curiously approached Ox number three and inquired about the identity of the newcomer. Was she a friend of Ox number three? Ox number three hesitantly replied, and then Lady Ox eagerly introduced herself as Ox number four. She greeted Sejin and expressed her interest in him being the one who promised to provide food to Ox number three if she turned the ground upside down. Sejin confirmed the promise, and then Ox number three, sounding downcast, asked Sejin if he could allow his friend to work here as well, or else it would cause a significant issue. Sejin stood there, observing the situation. After pondering for a while, Sejin responded that they had already plowed all the land, so they didn't require any additional help. However, he proposed another idea. He asked Lady Ox if she would be willing to work as a guard for Theo, who was being pursued by dangerous wolves. Sejin offered to pay her three tower coins per day for this service. Upon hearing this, Lady Ox became slightly annoyed and expressed her dislike for the offer. She didn't want tower coins, she desired something she could eat, not pieces of metal. Sejin was intrigued by the sudden change in her attitude. Although she had initially expressed interest in a job, she was now refusing. He inquired if there was a problem. Lady Ox irritably explained that she couldn't eat tower coins. She wanted the reward to be something edible, not pieces of metal. Sejin realized that, just like Ox number three, he had struck gold. Lady Ox was willing to do anything for some onion leaves. Sejin promised her three meals a day and delicious snacks as a bonus if she performed her duties properly. Upon hearing this, Lady Ox became energized and assumed a battle-ready stance, clanging her fists together, indicating she was ready. Seeing this, Ox number three, in a panicked state, asked Sejin if he could also join in this job. Sejin, with a smile, knowing that Ox number three would also want to go, considering the reward was food, responded, okay, Ox number three can also accompany Ox number four. Theo will be safer that way. One can guard Theo while the other can fend off the wolves. With a gentle smile, Sejin continued, now, let's prepare some food and snacks for their journey. Just at the mention of the word, food, Ox number three and Lady Ox became excited and started cheering, exclaiming, food, yeah. In their excitement, Lady Ox jumped and tightly hugged Ox number three, expressing gratitude for introducing her to Sejin. Ox number three, feeling the warmth of Lady Ox for the first time, blushed a little, as he too was single like Sejin and the reader. Now, Ox number three, wanting to impress his crush, confidently stated that it was nothing, and as long as she continued to follow him, he would ensure she never ran out of food and promised to take good care of her. And so, they continued their adventure. Sejin, from behind, watched this romantic scene with a mischievous expression. Afterward, Sejin harvested some spring onions and managed to gather quite a big pile of them. He remarked, this should be enough for them. Then, Theo approached Sejin and informed him that he had packed all the cherry tomatoes in his bag and was ready to go. Sejin mentioned to Theo that there seemed to be a problem, Theo would have to remove some cherry tomatoes to make space for the spring onions for the minotaurs. Theo, with a smirk on his face, opened his cape and assured Sejin not to worry. He then threw his bag onto the pile of spring onions, and in an instant, all the spring onions were stylishly sucked into Theo's bag. Theo caught his falling bag with one hand. Witnessing this, Sejin was astonished and asked Theo how he managed to fit all the spring onions in his bag along with the cherry tomatoes. Theo proudly displayed his new merchant badge and explained that he had become a senior wandering merchant, allowing him to carry more things in his bag. Upon hearing this, Sejin, now addressing Theo with a newfound respect, called him Senior Theo. 
Sejin realized that the color and symbol on Theo's badge had indeed changed. Theo, slightly annoyed, retorted that Sejin had only noticed it now after he had mentioned it, and he wasn't happy about it. Sejin then playfully stretched Theo's cheeks, admitting his mistake and apologizing for it. Now, Theo needed to hurry and get ready. Sejin informed Theo that he had also packed some gifts for their family. He asked Theo to take those gifts and give them to Dong Shik. Theo turned around, giving a thumbs up, and confidently said, leave it to me. After finally packing everything, Theo, along with Ox Number 3 and Lady Ox, was ready to depart. As they set off, Theo bid farewell to Sejin, and Ox Number 3 and Lady Ox assured Sejin that they would make sure nothing happened to a single hair on Theo's head. Sejin waved, goodbye, to Theo, Ox Number 3, and the formidable Lady Ox, wishing them a safe journey and leaving Theo in their capable hands. After that, we see the merchant alley, the road leading to the lower floor's end. The wolves were keeping a watchful eye on Theo, as he had to pass through this gate to enter the lower floor. They were confident that Theo had no choice but to go through here. Then, in the scene, we witness Elka, holding three succulent pieces of roasted meat, confidently approaching the chieftain. With a proud voice, Elka announces that he has brought sustenance for the tribe. Intrigued, the chief inquires about the remaining provisions, to which Elka responds with a hint of melancholy that this is the last of their nourishment. Concerned, the chief turns to Elko, who is visibly disinterested and reluctant to fulfill his duty of guarding. With a heavy heart, Elko declares his lack of appetite, refusing to eat. Sensing the urgency in Elka's voice, the chief inquires how much longer they must endure this tedious wait. Exhausted from days of monotonously observing passers-by, Elka yearns to return to the 85th floor. However, instead of empathizing, the chief's face contorts with anger as he seizes Elko by his cape, shouting in frustration, demanding an end to his foolish utterances. He reminds Elko of the starving tribe members anxiously awaiting their return, their survival depends on the successful completion of their mission and acquisition of the coveted straw hat from Grid. The chief's expression becomes truly formidable, his eyes glinting with menace as he warns that failure to fulfill their task will result in the tribe's deprivation of food. Overwhelmed, Elko succumbs to tears, tearfully expressing remorse and pleading for forgiveness. He acknowledges his mistakes and vows to carry out his responsibilities diligently. Sighing heavily, the chief, clutching his head in exasperation, emphasizes the urgent nature of their mission, highlighting the dire consequences of further delays on the lives of their tribe members, who are already succumbing to hunger. Determined, they must find Theo, no matter the cost. Elko continues to wipe away his tears, while Elka stands steadfast with the last remnants of roasted meat. In an attempt to console Elko, Elka offers him a piece of chicken, insisting that he consume it to maintain his strength, even if he lacks appetite. Despite his continued weeping, Elko remains silent, listening intently to Elka's gentle, encouraging words. Displaying an act of generosity, Elka also extends a piece of meat to the chief. However, just as the chief is about to grasp it, his instincts kick in, causing him to abruptly turn around with lightning speed. His gaze becomes intense and focused as he scans the stairs below. Curious, Elka inquires about the cause of the chief's sudden change in demeanor, desperate to know what has caught his attention. However, the chief remains silent, for he has spotted Theo. Theo, blissfully unaware of the impending danger, cheerfully strolls beneath them. Filled with determination and fury, the chief growls, vowing to capture Theo at any cost determined to extract information about the straw hat. Theo is casually strolling through the passage village, but there is something else that has attracted everyone's attention. The two giant minotaur are exotic races for all of them, and the merchants stare at them in awe. They exclaim that they could have never seen a black minotaur in their lives because they were from the 99th floor, which might as well be on another planet. The merchants are really excited to meet the wandering merchant who hired them as free mercenaries. They believe that he must be the richest among the wandering merchants, 
but they are in for a surprise as Theo is standing right in front of them and asking them if they are talking about him. The two doggy merchants look at him with surprise and wonder what the deal is with the overconfident looking wandering cat merchant standing in front of them. Theo declares loudly that he is the magnificent wandering merchant who has hired the Minotaur as free mercenaries, almost acting like a mad villain as he laughs maniacally. The other two merchants ask him if he really is the employer because he doesn't look like it. They claim that they are hearing the name Theo for the first time, and tell him that he shouldn't lie to them just for some fake hype. Theo is furious at this and decides to show off his authority by summoning the Minotaurs to his side. However, as he turns around to see them all, he finds is a vacant lot. Theo is embarrassed and also panics because losing his bodyguards like this is a big deal, and he wonders where the two food-oriented muscle heads went. They are actually running around exploring the food options in the market. Ox number 4 points towards the cabbages on sale and tells her boyfriend that it is quite an odd-shaped grass while the poor rodent merchant selling them is afraid for his life. The poor guy is shivering and crying as he sees the two giant minotaurs who don't even realize his dilemma. Ox number 4 asks him if he sells this grass while Ox number 4 remarks that it looks delicious. The poor rodent merchant can only beg for them to spare his life as he squeaks. He would have given his products to the two minotaur for free out of fear if Theo had not arrived there just in time. Theo is fuming as he walks towards the two minotaurs and calls out to them saying that he has been looking for them everywhere. He lashes out at them, saying that they have been hired as mercenaries and that they should do their job properly by protecting him. He asks them what the hell they are doing here, and Ox number 3 nervously apologizes, saying that they got sidetracked because things here were so interesting. Even Theo is a bit taken aback as he hears this and asks them if this is their first time coming to the Passage Village. The ox affirms, saying that they have never left the 99th floor before this, so it is indeed their first time outside. Then ox number 3 asks Theo why this place is called the Merchant Passage because he has heard that everyone born in the tower has the right to access the tower's passage. He feels it is excessive to call it the Merchant Passage when they are not the only ones who use it. Theo laughs at his question and calls the Minotaur a country bumpkin from the 99th floor if he doesn't know this. And Ox number 3 considers that statement racist. Theo wants to show off his knowledge, but any show-off is incomplete until others are looking up to him. So he spots a carriage nearby and jumps atop it to begin his lecture about the history of the Tower Passage. He tells the confused Minotaur couple that the mid-level wandering merchant Theo will now kindly explain some important things to them. He starts the story which takes place a long time ago, much before the tower was as organized as it is now. He claims that in the earliest days, all the passageways of the tower were arbitrarily stretched out like the branches of a tree going from the first floor to the 99th floor. That wasn't a good thing at all because living in the tower was like playing a real-life version of snakes and ladders. At that time, there were too many passages, no one knew which one led them where, and on top of that, no one knew which passages were safe and which ones had dangers in them. Then a group of brave hearts assembled and decided to sort things out. They were the first wandering merchants of the tower who joined forces to organize the passages. They took care of the dangerous pathways and reinforced the safe ones to be used by others. The merchants were assisted by the two other forces in the tower, namely the Free Mercenary Association and the Magic Tower. They entered into an agreement with each other to develop and manage the passages, with the mercenaries and magic users providing the manpower while merchants provided resources to run the passages. However, since the management rights went to the Wandering Merchant Association, the passages were called Merchant Passageways. Theo's lecture impresses Ox number 3 and his girlfriend who clap for him, saying that he is quite well informed. The cat basks in the glory. Theo confidently says that this much is the basic knowledge for a mid-level wandering merchant when it was something even simpler than that. This information was given on the first page of the Guide to Beginner Wandering Merchants, and Theo has that evil grin on his face as he thanks himself for reading it beforehand. He then continues his lecture, 
saying that while all residents of the tower can access the passages, there are also premium passages that are hidden behind the paywall. He claims that these paid pathways can only be used by merchants, and they act like shortcuts to their destination. As Ox Number 3 holds out his hand for Theo to jump into it, he asks him to elaborate on the paid passages. Theo jumps onto his palm, saying that it is just as the name suggests, only merchants and those who can pay can use it. And right now, they are able to cross it because of him. He explains that if they go through a normal route, it will take a long time to reach their destination. Also, the passage village was the center of the area where all the paid passageways are concentrated. Theo climbs down from the Minotaur's hand, declaring that they have to go to the 38th floor, so they will use the paid passageway that takes them down quickly to the 40th floor, and from there, they will transfer to the regular passageway. Ox number 3 says that this way appears to be too complicated, and Theo agrees. That is why, before they start the second part of their journey downwards, they must eat something. The two miners are more excited than him to take their lunch break and even start drooling as they follow Theo to his favorite fish restaurant. However, as he turns around to ask the Minotaur what they like, the leader of the wolf mercenaries, Elka, pounces on him, ready to end his game. Theo realizes the danger when he is too close to him and freaks out as the big bad wolf makes its landing right next to him. Elka stares at him menacingly, saying that he finally found the wandering cat merchant. Theo is trembling from fear as he recalls the wolf mercenary who attacked him before. The wolf asks him to tell him where he got the straw hat from, totally unaware that something massive, fast, and heavy is coming towards him. He was lucky that the black minotaur missed his punch on purpose because otherwise, it would be his skull that would be crushed instead of the ground. Elka backs away, still ready to fight as he wonders what the hell a minotaur is doing here. Ox number 3 asks him who he is, and Theo screams that he is the wolf who attacked him before. He explains that he is the leader of the gang that has been chasing after him, and the black minotaur is ready to deal with him right away. He steps forward, saying that they should get rid of him, but just then, the other two wolves jump into the action to support their captain. They are aiming at Ox number 3, but they don't know that his girl has got his back. Ox number 4 quickly covers for her boyfriend, punches the two wolves, and sends them flying. Their leader Elka is worried about them while Ox number 4 says that she didn't know there were two more of the cute puppies. She tells her man to keep protecting Theo while she takes care of the wolves, and he leaves all of the fighting to her. Theo is uncertain about her fighting abilities and asks Ox number 4 if she will be fine on her own. But he replies that they are the Minotaur of the 99th floor and such little dogs are no match for their power. Then he blushes as he hypes up his girl, saying that she is even stronger than him. And Theo doesn't really get what is happening. He still yells at Ox number 4 to not kill the wolves, but she replies that she can't promise anything yet because she doesn't know how weak her opponents are. She walks towards the three wolves who are getting up and regrouping. Elka asks the other two if they are fine, and they reply that they are still okay. They ask him what they should do now, and Elka replies that they cannot back away now. He is serious about getting Theo and claims that if they fail to capture him here, they won't have any other chances. He takes the lead and tells his subordinates to get ready to fight because they will need to combine their strength to defeat the big monster in front of them. Meanwhile, on the 99th floor, something entirely different is happening. The sickle rabbit is using his immaculate skills with his tool to groom everyone. He finishes giving his chunky brother a haircut, and Sejin claps for him, saying that his skills are extraordinary. He has trimmed the fur of the black warrior rabbit before the fatty rabbit, and both of them are pleased. Now next up is Sejin's turn to get a fresh cut, and he claims that he is getting too uncomfortable because of his long hair. His hair has been coming down to his eyes and causing him a lot of problems, so he needs the sickle rabbit to cut down the length a bit. He wears a cloth of the same old green onion leaves while the sickle rabbit climbs on a stone to reach his level. Quang watches them from behind. The bear cub tries to tell the sickle rabbit something, 
but his warm moist breath tickles him, and he prepares to launch a devastating sneeze by rabbit standards. Unfortunately for Sejin, he still had his sickle in hand while she sneezed and managed to slice off a patch of hair from his head. It may be funny to us, but the sickle rabbit and Quang are absolutely horrified to see what they have done. Poor Sejin has no idea what has happened, and he is still looking forward to getting a haircut. The three silver wolf mercenaries, who are ready to face the challenge in front of them, ox number four. Despite knowing that they are not strong enough, rush towards her. Their leader, Elka, takes the lead and leaps high in the air to attack ox number four from above. She gets ready to punch him into oblivion, but that was what the wolves were banking on. Their plan involved letting her loosen her defenses as she got on the offense. A second wolf came to her side, shocking her. The third one also rushes towards her foot from the other side, and ox number four realizes that she is surrounded. Two of the wolves bite her arm and leg, while Elka prepares to deal the finishing blow. He holds her horn and yanks her head to the side, exposing her neck. He quickly swings behind her and uses all of his jaw strength to bite down on her neck. Ox number four stands incredibly still as the three wolves bite her because they are not doing any damage to her. Elka realizes that his sharp fangs weren't able to cut through the minotaur's tough skin, and he wonders what the hell is happening here. Ox number four asks him if he is surprised before rubbing salt in his wounds, telling him that a minotaur's skin can't be pierced through so easily. Then she gets on the offensive and smacks the wolf, who is biting her arm. The minotaur's slap is too powerful for the silver wolf who bleeds from his nose as he is flung away. Ox number four grabs him and then eats him away towards the wooden staircase. The wolf who was biting on her feet till now loosens his grip as he sees a comrade getting injured, but that was a serious mistake because a kick from ox number four was waiting for him. He also gets flung away, and now only Elka is left on the minotaur's shoulder. He realizes that there is no chance for them to win, as his friends get taken down with a single hit. However, he is determined to not let her go but that doesn't happen since ox number four yanks him away from her shoulder and slams him into the ground. Elka takes some damage and then looks pitiful, as ox number four is ready to finish him. As her heavy punch comes right toward his face, he screams no in his mind, and then his memories suddenly drift to his childhood. His grandfather was once the wise and respected leader of the tribe of Silver Wolves. He used to often tell him stories about how they were the pure-blooded silver wolves. When they die and become spirits, they turn into guardian spirits that protect the living members of the tribe. Their tribe was stronger than those of other wolves, and they also had the ability to grow their skills to track and hunt prey. They could inherit the will of their ancestors, and that made them proud silver wolves. Elka's grandfather used to tell him that their honor is the honor of their ancestors, and they must behave properly and live proudly. So that they do not ruin the honor of the ancestors who guided them. His grandfather told him that by living their lives honorably, they would arrive at an answer to their life's purpose one day. At that time, little Elka was really excited to hear those stories and promised his grandfather that he would live in honor of his ancestors. However, instead of finding an answer about his life's purpose, all the young wolf found was a long-lasting famine that dried up all their food sources. One day he found a fish in the remains of a pond and brought it back home where the adults were on their edge because of the famine. There was nothing to eat, and western tribes were even pillaging and slaughtering one another for food. The fire of their pillaging soon came to Elka's village too. The attackers burned their village and killed everyone who could not escape, and Elka could only get carried away by his parents, as he saw his grandfather sacrificing his life to save them. Years later, he became the new chieftain himself and led his tribe through the wasteland. One day, his tribesmen asked him if it was true that he had started to work under the landlord grid. They asked him if he was not embarrassed to trample on the honor of their ancestors by doing that. Not only was he serving someone, he was serving the lowly boar who was the one who caused all this in the first place. Elka commanded them to shut up, saying that they had no other way to survive. 
Even living for one more day was no less than a miracle, and he wanted to do everything he could to save the children. He was determined to sacrifice his honor and everything along with it for the sake of his tribe's children. Elka thought that his ancestors would understand his reasons even as he served a fat greedy pig landlord and did his dirty deeds. On the command of Grid, he harassed and extorted money from ordinary creatures and killed those who failed to pay. As he waits for the Minotaur's punch to finish him, Elka only wants to know if his grandfather understands him. Lucky for him, Ox Number 4 was not as heartless as she let on and had spared his life. She hit the area next to his head, but Elka was already knocked out cold because of the mental and emotional stress. He keeps saying that he would do all things for the sake of the children, as Theo comes to check up on him. Theo checks the wolf and wonders if he really passed out, and Ox Number 4 suggests an idea to deal with him for good. She wants to break his legs so that he cannot follow them around anymore, and Theo panics on hearing that. He acts vain and kind at the same time, saying that even though the sin of going after his life is too great, breaking the wolf's legs is too cruel. He commands the two Minotaur to take the wolves away for now because it should be Sejin who makes the decision about them. The Minotaurs obey his order and pick up the three unconscious wolves. Meanwhile, something interesting is going on with Sejin's cave. He was getting a haircut before, and to say the least, it started horribly. Now he has a blind spot on the back of his head that shines like a diamond, and Kung and the sickle rabbit, who are responsible for this, are sweating buckets. They discuss among themselves and wonder what to do, but Sejin asks them why it is taking so long. He checks his hair, asking them if the haircut is complete, and the two culprits realize they are so screwed now. Sejin soon finds the bald spot on his head, and he freaks out while Kung and Sickle Rabbit wonder what to do now. The Queen Poison Bee also comes there and takes a look at Sejin's bald spot, which is not visible to him. He thinks that if he knew something like this would happen, he would have asked Theo to get him a mirror. The Sickle Rabbit sincerely apologizes for being a bad barber, but Sejin tells her that it is okay, since everyone makes mistakes. He tries to calm him by saying that no one will even notice it since he is the only human here, and everyone else is a monster. He laughs as he puts his straw hat on, saying that if he uses this, no one can even see it. He keeps on laughing as he says that it is fine, but then goes to sulk in the corner because it is not fine after all. As Sejin is sitting in a corner, the mother rabbit comes there and asks her son and Kung what is happening. Upon hearing that the sickle rabbit messed up Sejin's hair, she gets furious at her. Through his tears, Sejin tells her that he is fine. The mother rabbit can see that he is not fine, so she volunteers to fix the mess caused by her son. Sickle rabbit also pesters him to sit and let his mother take care of the things. She tells Sejin to sit down for a haircut again and takes out a pair of sharp scissors from her dimension pocket. With a smirk look on her face, she made a chop-chop sound as if she were a 50 years experienced barber. On the other hand, tower manager Aileen is reading a book while snacking on cherry tomatoes. She says that reading is fun but then notices that she is out of cherry tomatoes already, which is not fun at all. Ever since Aileen got bigger, the amount of food she used to get from Sejin has become too little for her. Now she can't satisfy her hunger like this, but she can't even risk asking Sejin for more food. Aileen remembers how he misunderstood her last time and asked her if she was a winged pig, and she doesn't want to take the chance again because she is still irritated by it. However, her hunger wins over her fear of embarrassment, and she calls Sejin to give her a snack. However, she sees something in her magic crystal that surprises her. She asks Sejin what happened, and he looks back at her message while being shrouded in an air of mystery. Aileen says that his appearance has changed. Sejin rolls his scarf as if he were waiting for it. Then he says that his hair was too long, so Mother Rabbit helped him and cut it. Then he removes his head showing a nice, neat haircut and handsome face. He looks like as if he is a new Sejin. Seeing this Aileen was in a complete state of shock as she didn't expect something like this. 
On the other hand, Sejin is glowing with his new haircut. Flexing his handsome face as if he would immediately impress a girl if there were any. Sejin is feeling a bit awkward about his new haircut, and he asks Aileen if she also thinks the same. Judging by how dashing he looks, it might be possible that he just wants Aileen to praise him. Her reactions when she sees him in a new haircut are really animated, and she freaks out in silence for a while. Sejin wonders why she is not answering him for so long and once again asks her what she thinks about his new hairstyle as he moves his hand in front of the message window. Inside her library, Aileen is blushing like crazy and sweating a lot as she stares at the handsome face of Sejin. She lets out a scream as Sejin moves closer to the message window, and she sees his face more clearly. She tells him not to come closer to her, and Sejin only wonders if anything is wrong with her. Aileen replies that it is nothing before saying that she couldn't take her eyes off him for a second. After blurting out her honest feelings, Aileen quickly moves to the reason she contacted him in the first place. She wants food, specifically the crayfish he gave her the other day. Sejin puts his hat back as he sighs, asking what else could the manager contact him for. He tells her that she might have to eat her protein a bit slowly for some time. The crayfish population has been slowly decreasing, and it has fallen to one-third of what it used to be. Also, the piranhas are not showing their faces because of the crayfish, and Sejin is at a loss. He complains that he feels empty these days because he is eating only vegetables. Maybe if he had been wiser and more judicious about hunting the fish, it would have been better for him. Sejin then tells Aileen that it feels good to nurture one's body with different types of food and decides to give her some corn instead of meat right now. He asks her if she will be fine with tomatoes and corn and then remarks that she might have run out of dried sweet potatoes too. Sejin gives a big basket to her, and Aileen thanks him before hesitating to give him another message. Sejin waits for her to finish her sentence, and then Aileen tells him that the new hairstyle suits him. With that, the message window in front of him vanishes, and Sejin has a smug smile on his face as he says that it seems that the stingy tower manager knows how to give out compliments as well. However, now that he has dealt with her, he decides to get back to work again. Meanwhile, Aileen is in her cabin, and she is trembling as she holds the basket of corn. She is still red from embarrassment about seeing Sejin earlier. Her chest beats like crazy even though her heart is supposed to be inactive because of her disease. Aileen wonders what is happening with her, and her best guess is that it is another anomaly in her dragon heart because she doesn't know that it is actually her first love. She shakes away all the thoughts and speculations from her mind as she claims that she was just taken aback to see Sejin and a new look so suddenly. She decides to forget about it all and focuses on eating the food, however, that also reminds her of her love, Sejin, and how he said it would be good to nurture one's body with different kinds of food. Aileen immediately reaches out to her library and searches for a book. She soon finds the great cookbook and smiles to herself as she thinks that she is going to do something special for Sejin. She starts blushing again as she thinks about him and hides her face behind the book. On the other hand, Theo has finally reached the 38th floor to do business with humans. As soon as he declares his arrival, the human hunters flock towards him. They seem to be even more fired up today, and ask Theo how many tomatoes he has today. They say that a lot of people need the tomatoes right now, and Theo asks them why they are in such a hurry. He then reveals the good news to them as he carries out a basket from his bundle. He declares that this time he has a total of 3,600 cherry tomatoes, which will be sold in batches of 400 each. This is news for the hunters and a rather shocking one too. They can't believe that Theo has so many cherry tomatoes at once, but it works in their favor. The bidding starts, and the price of each batch of 400 cherry tomatoes reaches up to 200 tower coins before Theo closes the deal. One by one, he sells four batches of the cherry tomatoes, and now 2,000 more units are remaining. As Theo is about to proceed with the auction, a man steps up to him and tells him that there is no need for that. 
he volunteers to buy all of the 2,000 magical cherry tomatoes for 1,600 tower coins. The man is the subordinate of Michael, the Gaggle Food Company's vice chairman, who sent him here to buy all the D-ranked cherry tomatoes he could find. The man looks at other hunters and taunts them, asking if there is anyone who wants to enter a bidding war with the Gaggle Company. No one has either the money or guts to do that, D and Theo sell the rest of his product to the subordinates of Michael. Meanwhile, the rest of the hunters worry about the scarcity of cherry tomatoes in the outside world and complain that it is unfair for a large corporation like Gaggle to monopolize the entire market. Kim Dongshik, the leader of the Phoenix Guild, also agrees with them and thinks that ordinary hunters like them can't manage to buy anything at this rate. His teammates panicked because they wanted the magical cherry tomatoes badly. One of them had even staked his marriage on the chance of impressing his future in-laws with magical cherry tomatoes. As everyone panics, Dong Shik is relatively calm because he is personally acquainted with Theo. He also knows about Sejin and thinks that it is easy for him to make a direct connection with him. However, he is in for the shock of a lifetime as one of the hunters who purchased the cherry tomatoes noticed something new. It was an employee of Gaggle who found out that the information window of the cherry tomato was displaying something new. The name of the cultivator, which was previously hidden, is now shown. Everyone is excited to learn this, and they think that the name of the cultivator sounds Korean. As one of them speaks it out loud, revealing Tower Farmer Park Sejin is the cultivator of the crops. Dong Shik can't believe his ears. He snatches a tomato out of one man's hand and says he will return it after taking a look at it. He finds that the information window of the tomato has really been modified, and the name of Sejin is on the bottom as the cultivator of the crop. More than anything else, Dong Shik is shocked to learn that Sejin was actually a tower farmer. The revelation of the cultivator's identity creates an uproar among the Gaggle employees. Their leader tells everyone to head back to the earth as fast as they can and find out about the man called Park Sejin. He commands them to mobilize all the manpower they have to ensure that he comes over to their side. The leader of the mission starts laughing like a madman, saying that since he found out about such a vital piece of information, he will certainly be given due credit by Michael. He even thinks that he has secured a promotion for himself with this discovery. However, Dong Shik is in panic mode because the connection he has with Sejin has become less valuable. But even more pressing than that is the issue of Sejin's family's safety. Dong Shik thinks that the family is in danger because for the rich, the magical cherry tomatoes are the most valuable thing right now, and they won't stop at anything to get their hands on them. He fears that since they cannot get to Sejin directly, there is a high possibility that those people will try to blackmail him by kidnapping his family so that they can monopolize the supply. Dong Shik thinks that according to what he already knows, Sejin has never left the tower because of a quest, and he can't reach to help his family. He also realizes that Sejin won't know about the situation outside the tower since he has no contacts, and he won't have any idea how dangerous things have suddenly become for his family. Just then, Theo reaches Dong Shik to talk about their usual business, and without wasting a moment, Dong Shik picks him up and runs away to an isolated spot. Theo is confused and asks him what is wrong, and after confirming that they are alone, Dong Shik asks him what the deal is with the cultivator's name in the information window. He asks why the name, which was previously censored, is suddenly visible to all. Theo replies that it is because he became a mid-level wandering merchant and shows off his batch too. He explains that to protect the suppliers and producers of newbie merchants, their names are hidden, but that feature is taken back when they are promoted. He asks Dong Shik what is wrong only to learn that Sejin's family might be in danger. Theo freaks out on hearing this and wonders what is happening. So Dong Shik explains the situation outside the tower to him. He claims that in the real world, everyone is in an uproar because of the magical cherry tomatoes. Till today, everything was fine because the name of the cultivator was hidden, but now that it is revealed, things are different. Dong Shik claims that many people won't hesitate to do bad things to get a monopoly over the magical cherry tomatoes, 
and the easiest way to do this is to target Sajin's family. Theo's jaw drops on hearing this, and he panics as he wonders if all this is his fault. He asks Dongshik if it is because he became a mid-level merchant and asks what he should do now. He fears that Sejin will be angry at him, but Dongshik tells him to calm down. He promises that he will save Sejin's family at all costs, even if he needs to put the honor of the Phoenix Guild on the line for that. Theo thanks him, and Dongshik says that he will quickly return to the lower floors of the tower. Now, before he goes, Theo has another favor to ask of him. He takes out two baskets from his bundle, saying that they are gifts for Sejin's family. The baskets contain carrots of agility and corn of stamina, and Dongshik can't believe his eyes as he reads their information window. Theo tells him that the reward for completing the favor is the same as the last time, which is 200 magical cherry tomatoes. Dongshik is amazed to see this and remarks that if the world finds out about these crops, it will be a riot. However, he doesn't tell Theo everything and asks him not to worry about anything. Dongshik asks the cat merchant to relay his message to Sejin, telling him that he will deliver everything to his family safely. With that, Theo leaves the 38th floor, and Dongshik thinks that things are getting out of control and that he must inform his master about this. Meanwhile, at the entrance of the 38th floor's passageway, the Minotaur couple and the Silver Wolf mercenaries are waiting for Theo. While the Minotaur munch on grass, the leader of the wolves, Elka, lashes out at them. He calls them small-headed idiots and asks if they have no pride. He asks them how they can be working under a lowly wandering merchant cat and obey him without complaint. He insults them, saying that the legends about the monsters on the 99th floor were fake after all. Ox number 4 is getting irritated because of his rambling and asks her boyfriend if she should hit Elka's head one more time. He tells her that the poor wolf will die if she does that. Just then, Theo comes running to them and tells them that they have to immediately return to the 99th floor because it is an emergency. Ox number 4 asks him what's up, and Theo says that he will explain everything along the way. The Minotaurs pick up the wolves, who continue to curse them as they demand to be freed. However, before they can depart, Theo tells the Minotaur to wait for a bit since he has spotted something in a stall. He goes to a stall run by a raccoon merchant and asks him for the price of a necklace with a violet gemstone. The merchant tells him that it is worth two tower coins, but Theo is planning to use his ultimate bargaining technique and asks the poor merchant for a discount while the two Minotaurs look over him.